even outside of BFR, which seems to provide a very elegant tool to test the hypothesis, as, as you've explained and we'll get into in a little bit more detail, um, it seems that you could do other experiments to test this even without blood flow restriction. For example, couldn't you, you know, have somebody do workouts where they only do one to five reps of exercises and they're basically always functioning and each of those is to failure, right? So if you're doing one rep, it's a one rep max. If you're doing two reps, it's 95% of one rep max. If it's three reps, it's probably 90%. If it's five reps, it's probably 85% of one rep max. And so you, 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 you cycle through those workouts where you increase strength. In fact, uh, I'll put a very practical example to this. I, I know specifically athletes who train this way and they train with a trap bar and they do not do the eccentric motion. So they lift the weight up and drop it, lift the weight up and drop it. And they're never going above five reps. So they're really trying to maximize strength, which comes more from the concentric movement. And they're trying to minimize any hypertrophy because they're athletes for whom strength to weight is the most important ratio. So it's a very typical workout for runners. Um, so they'll dramatically increase their strength without adding size. And then you could compare that to the opposite type of workout where you do more of a bodybuilding workout. You're probably never going below eight reps and you'll get bigger. And I could imagine a scenario where you don't even get as strong as that other person. I mean, wouldn't that demonstrate how uncoupled these two metrics can be? Yes, I, I agree with you. And we've done this several times now. Um, we have, we've tried to address this question via study design, doing something very similar to what you said, where we have one group that's training, just doing the one RM test. That's it. They come in, they work up to about five total reps, and then they go home uh, because we're trying to maximize the strength signal but not get growth. Because essentially, to answer this question, we have to know if the muscle did get bigger and stronger, what would strength look like if muscle growth had not occurred. So when we look at the traditional training group, uh, we have them doing about eight to 12 reps. And this is a very simple movement, the bicep curl. In that group, we see muscle growth and we see a change in strength. Now, what previous, uh, or what a, what a majority of articles would do is say, given that muscle growth is there, that muscle growth must be contributing to strength. In our mind, we have to say, well, what would strength look like if growth hadn't been there? And when we look at the other group that was just doing 1RMs, the strength is the same. Now, it's not greater, but it is the same. I, I do think that the more complex the movement becomes, the, the greater that separation starts to happen. Mm -hmm. So if we were doing a barbell bench press, my guess is, is that the group doing 1RM or, or close to a 1RM would be far better than an 8 to 12. But it's just the fact that the movement is very, very simple. So similar to what you said, in, in our mind, this does provide some method of trying to address this because we see a group with no growth compared to a group with growth, but the strength is the same, suggesting that that change in muscle size is not necessary for a change in strength, nor does it appear to be contributing given that the strength is the same. Now, there are limitations with that. One of the, the big ones is, is that in order to get the, that differential in growth, we had to apply slightly different exercise patterns. So one group was doing eight to 12, still a high load, but not 100% where we had another group training at 100%. So some suggested that, well, that's not really that fair of a comparison. There's more things that are different than just the muscle growth. And that's, that's true. And they suggested that instead, that we should follow that up with some mediation analysis, where we look at how much of this change relative to a control is driven by muscle size within each group individually. And when we did that, we did not see any mediation. 
meaning that none of the change in strength could be explained by that change in muscle size in either one of the groups. How, explain that more for me. I'm not sure I follow um, how you would determine that. So there, there are some statistical kind of approaches where you can do some causal mediation. In other words, you can look at the relationship between, let's say we have these two exercise groups. So instead of looking at them head to head, let's look at them individually compared to a group that's not doing any exercise at all. That way we can kind of really control for the random error across time. So measurement noise, random biological variability, et cetera. Essentially what mediation is doing is saying, okay, we have this group here. How much strength did they gain? So they got stronger. So that's a direct relationship. So when this group exercises, they got stronger. Now mediation says, okay, let's add in a variable here to see if we can remove this relationship either partially or completely. So if, if we add in muscle growth to the model and then this group no longer correlates with strength, then we'll know that that relationship is completely driven by this, this other variable. Now we wouldn't expect for it to be completely, right? But if you but we would expect for it yeah. partially, mm -hmm. but that's we didn't see that in either one of the groups. Is the contrapositive then that it's not at all coupled? Because if you were to ask me what my intuition is, which is worth maybe a warm bucket of hamster vomit, um, my intuition would be there is an association, but it's not a it's not it's not a hundred percent causal. So. You know, like the R squared might be 0.5, not 0.99. So in other words, I would not guess that there is no association. I certainly wouldn't guess a negative association, um, but I wouldn't guess that it's one-to-one -one causal. Can the mediation tease that out? Yes, because it would be a partial mediation in that and sense. And you did not now, see a partial mediation? No, we didn't see any effect at all. Now, hmm. there, there are other potential reasons. I mean, we have to think about random error across time with our measurement and, and, and things of that. I, I don't think that any of the work that we have done so far can, can conclusively say that it, it plays no role. But I, I do think that we're having an accumulating amount of evidence that's suggesting that if it does play a role, it is so small that we aren't able to ever detect it. So I am not sure that muscle growth in response to exercise is a mechanism. Wow. I've seen no experimental evidence that suggests that that's the case. Now, for a practical, pragmatic person, what would that mean for them? Well, I think what it could mean is, is that if you are interested in maximal strength and getting as strong as possible, you probably don't care whether it's a mechanism or not. You just want to know, how do I get strong? I think we can learn a couple things from some of these experiments. One, that there's a huge specificity component, meaning that if you want to be a very good squatter or a very good deadlifter, and being a very good squatter or being a very good deadlifter means you're able to lift as heavy as possible one time, then that means you should be training at least a good portion of the time at or close to that one RM. Now, if you really believe that growth might be playing some role, what that might mean for you is to say, well, I, if it is playing a role, it might be pretty small. So maybe I can allocate less overall time to it, which would be good for most strength athletes because that's typically what requires a lot of recovery because you're doing a lot of volume to see a, to make a muscle grow. So I, I become more skeptical of muscle growth as a mechanism every year that goes by. We're still doing more experiments to try and try and address this. Um, but there certainly is no evidence right now that suggests that it is a mechanism. We have a lot of evidence that suggests that it isn't, but I do think it would be premature to say, well, we've completely ruled it out. I don't think that's fair to say at all. So what are some other explanations? I mean, I, I guess nobody's disputing the neurologic component to this. Um, is one hypothesis that that is the entirety of it? Or do you think that there is another mechanism that isn't fully clear? Yes. 
I think some people would say that some people are of the opinion that the exercise induced changes are probably predominantly neural. I, I'm not there yet. I think that there could be some local changes at the muscle um, and that might be able to explain why some groups get stronger. That's not just neural. In other words, maybe the muscle uh, at the local level is actually getting better at responding to forceful contractions. So maybe it's you know how it deals with calcium or how the myosin head binds. Maybe there's some alterations there qualitatively that aren't due to muscle size, but I don't know what, what those would be necessarily. I can only offer potential, potential reasons. But, um, and I, I think that's usually the argument that's brought up mostly ag against our point is, well, if muscle growth is not a mechanism, then what exactly is it? And I don't think that that's a fair argument, honestly, because I don't know that you have to know for sure what something is to say, we don't have a lot of evidence for this and there's a lot of evidence against this. But that, that's just my kind of thinking. But I, I, I do think that there probably is a huge neural component, but I, I, I don't know that there, uh, there isn't something going on at the local level that is independent of a change in muscle size, but, but, but it is still muscular, perhaps.